Thank you for joining us on this Good Friday as we come together by the wonders of technology and welcome to our home here in Ball Lane or at least our garden. And joining us will be Anne Davidson Lund in Onston, John Dawson in Kingsley and Matthew Kimpton Smith in Norley, all in isolation of course. And so let us carry on now with our devotions. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? So ask that lovely and powerful hymn, so often sung on and around Good Friday. The answer of course is that we weren't. But in the pages of scripture, we can read the testimony of those who were, those who experienced firsthand the grief, the horror, the pain, and the anguish of watching Jesus nailed to the cross. Today we listen again to their testimony and to seek to get behind their words through asking what else each might have to say to us about that day given the opportunity. We share in music, readings and meditations as we hear from Pilate, Simon of Cyrene and the mother of one of the thieves so that as far as possible, in imagination, if not in flesh, we can be there, confronted by the Christ who died for all, who died for us. According to John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 38. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nations and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. 
Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. Truth, I said. What is truth? No, I wasn't trying to be clever, despite what some people may tell you. I really meant it. For I'd encountered so many over the years convinced they had the answer each swearing blind that they knew best, party to some special knowledge denied to others. Well, they couldn't all be right, could they? And the way I see it, none of them were. Some were downright crazy, others well-intentioned but misguided. A few with genuine insights to offer. But not one of them had the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Life just isn't like that, black and white. And anyone who thinks otherwise is potentially dangerous, all the makings of a dictator or a fanatic. Believe me, I've trodden that road myself. So when this Jesus fellow trotted out the same old refrain, you can understand my being sceptical. Quite simply, I'd seen it all before, or at least that's what I thought. Only it soon became apparent that there was more to this man than met the eye. Something quite out of the ordinary. I'd expected him to launch straight away into some diatribe to tell me, as they always do, why he was right and I was wrong. But he didn't. He just looked at me with an expression that left me mystified, unlike anything I'd seen before. None of the usual cocktail of fear and bravado laced with a liberal dash of resentment, not even the remotest suggestion of it. Instead, there was what seemed like pity, concern, even compassion as though he was genuinely disappointed I didn't understand, as though he longed for my eyes to be opened, as though he actually cared about the way I responded. It threw me completely. I don't mind admitting it. After all, I was the one conducting the trial, not him. At least, that's how it should have been. Yet it didn't feel that way. It was as though my life was being weighed there in the balance and found, sadly, wanting. Ridiculous. A man in my position to feel I had to answer to some Judean nobody. But, try as I might, I just couldn't shake the feeling off. And the more I tried to wriggle off the hook, the more hopelessly impaled I became. Do you still ask, what is truth? I don't, for I know the answer now. I saw it there that day in the eyes of that man. And I wish to God I hadn't, for it's haunted me ever since. The knowledge that for the first time in my life I had the chance to make a stand. To commit myself to something which really mattered. And I let it slip through my fingers. I held the difference between life and death in my hands that day, his fate in my hands, and I decided finally on death. The trouble is I'm not sure whose fate we're talking about, his or mine.
Gospel according to Mark, chapter 15, verses 21 to 24. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine and myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide which each should take. Simon of Cyrene, Second Meditation He was tired, just about dead on his feet, and it wasn't just due to that cross he was carrying. No, that was the easy bit. It was the other burdens he'd been bearing for so long, and the load he still had to endure that was getting to him. Oh, the cross was heavy, don't get me wrong, if anyone knows that. It's me. And the beating he'd taken was enough to break any man, even the strongest of us. Yet, I still say, there's more to it than that. Far more. You only had to look into his eyes, as I did, and see the agony there. An agony, not of body, but soul. Not of flesh, but spirit. He was used to physical pain by then, ready for anything else they might throw at him. So when they hammered the nails into his hands and feet, when they hauled the cross into position, despite turning down the wine and myrrh they offered him, he scarcely flinched, barely giving them the satisfaction of a groan. But he was suffering no question. Suffering more deeply, more hellishly than I'd imagined possible before. It was as though a light went out within, as though he were being crushed by some extraordinary weight, as though he were enduring such torment that physical pain seemed trivial by comparison. I was mystified at first, unable to imagine what could be more terrible than crucifixion. But then, suddenly, just before he died, he looked up, and the eyes were bright, the face radiant, all sign of pain vanished. It is finished, he shouted, and I understood then that he'd carried a burden beyond all imagining. Almost, you might say, the weight of the whole world on his shoulders. And at last, now, having been faithful to the end, he could put it down, knowing the struggle was over, the job was done, mission completed.
Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember me, he cried, when you come into your kingdom. Remember the poor wretch who suffered and died beside you. What made him ask it? I really don't know. But there was something about that man Jesus which clearly touched him. Enough, apparently, despite the agony he endured, to inspire that last desperate plea. It came as a complete surprise, that's for sure, for he wasn't a religious man. His faith, not just in God, but in everything, long broken by then. You see, he knew he'd done wrong and he wanted to change, to put the past behind him and start again. But what hope did he have? For how many were there ready to give him a second chance, willing to believe he could mend his ways? None. One mistake, one moment's madness, and he was an outcast, a reject, condemned to spend the rest of his life in the gutter, devoid of hope, devoid of meaning. No wonder he couldn't take it. Eventually he just snapped, throwing not just scruples but caution to the wind, and after that there could only be one result. It broke my heart when they caught him, for he was still my son, whatever he'd done, yet he seemed resigned by then, as if he accepted he deserved punishment for his crimes. But as they lifted up his cross, he caught sight of Jesus nailed there beside him, and his expression changed in a moment from dull despair to anger, disbelief, dismay. I knew what he was thinking, for I felt it too. Why this man, a man who was so clearly innocent, not an ounce of evil in him, not even the faintest suggestion of hatred or malice, he took everything the crowds threw at him, the insults, the ridicule, the rejection. And even when the other fellow hanging there beside him joined in the abuse, hurling down curses, his reaction never changed. No anger, no resentment, no curses in return. It was the first time I'd seen anything like it, the only time. And clearly it touched my son as much as it touched me. For next thing I knew, I heard his voice calling out loud and clear, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I caught my breath then, afraid of what might happen next. For why should Jesus listen, there of all places? No one else ever did. What reason to think he'd have time for anything but his own agony? Yet he turned with a look I shall never forget, such love such joy, such acceptance in his face, and he spoke these wonderful words, today you will be with me in paradise. Was it true? 
Well, I can't tell you, can I? Not in this life anyway. If you want proof, you must wait and see. But I can tell you this, when they cut down my boy and I held him in my arms, you should have seen the smile on his face, the peace and joy which radiated from him, happiness which I'd given up hope of ever seeing again. It was enough for me. I knew then, beyond doubt, beyond question, that Jesus had heard his prayer and answered him.
May the cross of our Lord protect those who belong to Jesus and strengthen our hearts in faith to Christ, in hardship and in ease, in life and in death, now and forever. Amen.